Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. Today, we're going to discuss all things research, as we have a very special guest. Uh, my co-host is joining me again, Dr. Joe Ritchie. How are you doing, Joe? Doing great. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm Jeff Jensen. I'm the host of the podcast and the dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine. Welcome to Dean's Chat, Hiro Shibuya. Hello. Dr. Shib- um, welcome. Okay. Welcome, Dr. Shibuya. Uh, Dr. Shibuya is joining us as the Associate Dean at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley School of Podiatric Medicine. And Hiro, we go with first names on Dean's Chat, if that's okay with you, Hiro and Joe and Jeff. Of course. Sounds good. Well, Hiro, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to come chat with us. And um, I have recently gotten to know you a little bit through the journal and then also through some of the AO faculty education programs. Um, and I think there's so much um, wealth of knowledge that you have that you could share with our community. And we're really excited to have you. Thanks. I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction. Again, it's going to be somewhat brief, um, as you are quite the accomplished uh, surgeon at this point. Um, but Dr. Shibuya graduated from the University of California, San Diego, with his uh, bachelor's degree in molecular biology and philosophy. Um, you have a master's degree in science and clinical um, investigation at the UT uh, Health Science Center in San Antonio. Graduated from Temple University College of Podiatric Medicine and completed your three-year surgical residency in Cleveland, Ohio. You did go on to do a fellowship with UT San Antonio, and you said it was mostly a a research clinical type um, fellowship, and we're interested to hear more about that later today. And currently, you're also um, the Associate Dean of Research at the um, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley College of Podiatric Medicine, but you've also been Professor of Surgery at Texas A&M. College of Medicine prior to joining the UTRGV family. So welcome to Dean's Chat. You are a prolific clinical scientist in our profession. Have you always been interested in research, Hero? Yeah, I think it came in when I, you know, when I was a resident, actually, you know, I don't know if you guys know Gerard Yu. Uh, Yeah. A lot of young guys don't know him already. He was, you know, big in education back in the days. And uh, he, one year, he was my residency director. And one year, he came down to San Antonio to le- do the lecture for San Antonio resident. And uh, he met Lawrence Hawkless, who was at the UT San Antonio at that time. And he was talking to Gerard Yu about how research is important and academic medicine, which we have to go to that direction as a profession. And they had a talk. So, um, uh, you know, that's how, you know, Gerard Yu placed me into Texas. But my girlfriend at that time, who is my wife, uh, <laughs> resident at the UT San Antonio. So, uh, so I could take time to go to San Antonio during residency program to meet her, but I have to go down there to do research. So I actually did some project in San Antonio when I was a resident. And, um, you know, that was an excuse that Gerard Yu created for me to see my girlfriend. And then (laughs) I stuck in San Antonio since then in Texas. Yeah, That's fantastic. That's uh, uh, not at all what I was expecting in such a fun and interesting story. And again, some of the fun stuff about this podcast that Dr. Jeff has started is like getting to know people on this much more personal level. Um, and such a real story. Um, I know we've had some really nerdy conversations about statistics over some beverages. Um, were you always interested in statistics or did you have a background at all in that from any prior experience? No, I just, I just wanted to find truth, really. Um, you know, like, ba- especially back in the days, what we were taught in school was really, you know, this is how I do it, so you should do it. And I always... <laughs> had a problem with it you know are you sure this is really the way to go so i was always curious about the truth so in order to get to the truth i felt like i have to know stats and you know research method otherwise you just you know you have to trust someone and then you know we don't know for sure it's working yeah what resources do you suggest to students when they're wanting to brush up or learn more or um, where did you get some of your knowledge from YouTube. 
<laughs> I love it. You're such a such a young and and useful mentor for these young students coming in. It's amazing I, what you can find on. I YouTube. mean, everything is on YouTube, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a better search engine than uh, Google nowadays. I I guess uh, yeah. or GPT. I mean, the answer is there. You just have to find out what's you know fake news versus you know real news. Uh, mm -hmm. So even when I teach students, you know, I try not to teach things that they could find in the Google and chat GPT, you know, they try to talk about experience and, you know, curveballs and, you know, so that they don't get bored in the classroom. That makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. And you're right. Go the ahead. answers are there. Sometimes the hard part's knowing which questions to ask. Exactly. Exactly. So I have a question for you. How'd you go from a uh, did you say molecular biology and, and philosophy? Philosophy. All right. yeah. in, into podiatric medicine and, and then across the country to Temple. I'd be interested in that story and especially the philosophy part. All right. So uh, if you remember Jurassic Park 1, that was when I was in high school. So the molecular biology was huge. DNA, what's yeah. in uh, And the UC San Diego was huge in the, you know, uh, DNA, you know, the one of the Watson or Click or whoever was there as a professor too. So that's how I got into it and just, you know, went to the school there. And obviously I didn't study too much and it's in San Diego and it's hard to study. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's how I got into it. And the philosophy, when you when you study molecular biology, something you can see and more everything is reduced down to DNA and things like that. You start wondering about, you know, knowledge and you know something minimal stuff uh and foundation of knowledge so that's how i kind of wanted to study uh uh study of knowledge that was under uh, a minor in philosophy makes sense you know i lived in san diego for a couple of years and our philosophy on in mission bay was that there's no life east of i-5 <laughs> <laughs> yeah mission bay you're spoiled yep, yeah very much so but how I got into so how I got into poetry from there is really accident because you know when you're like kind of pre med you know you do a lot of volunteer stuff and it's not all about GPA so I I volunteered at UCLA and uh, VA in uh, West LA and that's um, so I did urology and the poetry because that's who they assigned me to <laughs> as a student undergrad. And, uh, you know, I met people there uh, and I, great guys. Well, actually, this is a great story too, if I have a couple of minutes. <laughs> so I met a lot of guys as a, you know, residents in the urology. And uh, I met, you know, interns and residents from podiatry. And uh, intern then, I don't know if you know her, Oxon Newborn. Oh, yeah. Was an intern there. So I met her and she got me into podiatry and that's how I got into the podiatry. Uh, recently, I visited the UCLA program, you know, just to visit the program. And she was the chief of, you know, surgery at the VA. She's a big shot now. And I actually met a lot of guys there at the VA and the UCLA. And a lot of the chief of urology and those guys were the residents when I visited them, say, 20, 23, 24 years ago. So, that's amazing how those residents uh, are now chief of major, you know, world known universities. Yeah, it's 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 funny sometimes how small the world is. Right. And then as we mature in our careers, like seeing where people go and what they end up doing and some are big surprises, right? Like, wow, I would have never expected that person. And then others are like, oh, that is right where you belong. So that right. that's a really neat uh Seven degrees of separation story, or less than that. But you know, you know, Hero. When uh, Joe and I have been doing these interviews, and, and we're interviewing fellowship directors like uh, Dr. Scott here in Phoenix, and uh, Dr. Ruck, Dr. Kieran Mann, Gerard Yu's name comes up over and over and over again. What was it like training under Gerard? It was a character, <laughs> and uh, I probably learned more about non podiatry stuff than <laughs> podiatry stuff. I mean, things change. Our science change over time. Like the last 20 years, a lot of things change. So a lot of things I learned in OR probably, you know, not going to go nowadays, but I learned how to, you know, 
do things uh, outside of the apply tree, um, you know, family versus making money versus teaching versus all that stuff, you know, I, I learned from him. Uh, he was a character, you know. Yeah. He's one I've actually never met, but I know his name very well. He impacted a lot of people's lives. So yeah. when you did your fellowship in San Antonio, um, who influenced you there? Dr. Harkless was there. And, and what, what areas of research really uh, kind of stimulated you where you wanted to do more and more? So when I got there, you know, of course, you know, wherever I go, my mentor leaves. <laughs> I went to Cleveland and then, of, you know, of course, Georgia died when I was a third year. And when I went to San Antonio, Huckless left to California. So <laughs> <laughs> wherever I go, you know, they leave. Uh, so, uh, you know, he got me there and uh, I was there. But, uh, you know, there's so as a as a fellow, I, we have to take a master's degree there and uh, we take classes and so I had a mentor in that master's courses. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I learned uh, research there. Okay. Two-year program uh, sponsored by NIH. And that's how I learned um, research there. Uh, what I was interested was really, you know, because that was after residency. So, you know, a lot of polite stuff, right? Like reconstruction, trauma, infection, diabetic stuff. So really polite stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of the foot and ankle stuff is not COVID or not, you know, flu or not, not major uh, research stuff that you can get grants or, you know, you could uh, publish into a major journals. But because of my profession as foot and ankle, I was just curious about uh, what I was taught and if they are true. Circle back to that philosophy degree. Yeah. I can I can see all the themes like aligning right now. When I right. Understand all right. Here. So you, you got a foundation, <laughs> you got a foundation of knowledge from mm -hmm. you know polite school, which was not evidence based. A lot of times, I'm not saying all that you know everything wasn't evidence based, but a lot of it, right? Especially in surgery, a lot of things is like yeah. how I do it, right? So all the foundation kind of broke down when I went to the fellowship, you know, and when I read and when I learned about study design and research, then all of a sudden I can't trust anything. You know, I have to reread all the papers that I read uh, three, four years ago. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, because the next thing I'd love to pivot to is your role as the editor in chief for the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery, because, again, kind of following this idea of you know, being curious. And so for our prospective students that are out there that are, you know, wanting to get more information about podiatry as a career for our current students and kind of thinking about where they want their careers to go. And then even for the residents and, you know, those recently out of practice that might be listening, what other things they could get involved in. And I think having that curiosity and that, you know, testing scientific, like, oh, this is interesting. I don't know if I agree with it. And, you know, to the point of, you know, how, how do we trust something like we can try to trust what people say but is it reproducible is it um is it a standardized approach and as medicine as a whole and i agree has shifted right. even just in the last 15 years much more to evidence-based philosophy and and now evidence-based curriculums and, and you know all, all of the shifting mm -hmm. so pivoting into this role as you became the editor in chief for the journal. Yeah. Yeah. What have you seen in terms of trends or, or shifts or changes in the type of articles that are coming through? Well, um, you know, before that, I want to point out that you pointed out the one good point that, you know, a lot of times we rely too much on evidence-based medicine, but is it reproducible, right? Yeah. I know you guys in, when you guys are in California, you know, writing a paper on lapidus with two screws. That might work in your hands because you guys are great surgeons and you could do everything perfectly, but does it work for other surgeons and across the country, right? So that's something that, you know, students need to remember that, you know, everything sounds like evidence-based in an article doesn't mean that it could apply to uh, your student. 
But going back to, yeah, what changes I see in the articles, well, uh, the things submitted were a little more higher evidence uh, articles. Um, we kind of artificially created that way too, because we have now new journal, sister journal, Fast Track, that mm -hmm. focuses on techniques and case series. So all that articles go to that um, uh, journal. So we, did you did you create that? No, no, that was before okay. me. Okay. Yeah. So before me, the Scott Malay was the <laughs> editor in chief for Journal of Front Ankle Surgery. He did a really great job in the last 10, 12 years, I think he was in tenure, um, to try to make it a little more evidence medicine. You know, people complain about a lot of stuff, but he was the one actually slowly and gradually, you know, moved towards more evidence medicine. And then at the end of his tenure, he kind of, you know, branched off to two journals so that the case series, which is still important, technique yeah. papers are still important because a lot of the membership still wants to know how other people do it. Mm -hmm. So we still have to keep those. But at the same time, I wanna, we, want, we wanted to keep the Journal of Clinical Surgery as more evidence-based medicine journal while people can enjoy techniques and case series in different journals. So the big, biggest changes is the level of evidence within the clinical, uh, general clinical surgery got higher over time. You know, Hiro, that makes sense because one of the biggest challenges for clinicians is there's usually a gap between the evidence and what the data states and then actually carrying it out in practice. Exactly. So to have that case series kind of yeah. um, segue into the gap, right, between what right. we know we should do and what we're actually doing in practice, That's I think good. is very meaningful. Those are still important, right? Because if Gerard Yu wrote the article in the case series, that's going to, you know, it all mean something to me because I use a similar technique so I could reproduce his case series. Um, so those are still important and membership enjoy uh, reading those techniques and stuff like that. So we kept it uh, in the fast track journal. I think it's also really valuable to have the 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 spark, the curiosity, right? Someone does a, a case series and another person reads this and they're like, that's really interesting. I've seen five or six of these. And actually, I'm going to reach out to somebody and let's look at this more collectively and start to think about maybe creating something bigger than just a case series. Right. So in this line of thinking, what are some tips or pieces of advice that you might give to students and residents in terms of how to conduct quality research find a mentor <laughs> that's a great one <laughs> that's 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 the bottom line because you, it's too overwhelming if you try to do everything again it's much easier today because of the google and chat gpt but still still hard to you know it's not just uh, how to design it's it's about how to writing it's how to do the regulatory stuff like rrb and all that stuff so Finding the mentor who's done it is the mm -hmm. easiest way to go. Or if the school uh, supplies all the you know trainings and stuff like that, that's that's the best way to go. Don't try to you know do everything by yourself. That is my uh, advice, biggest of advice. That that makes sense. So I have a question for you. I, I've done a bunch of NIH and DOD work in the area of fracture care, diabetic foot. Where do you see? podiatric medicine having an avenue into different NIH type grants? Is it in infectious disease? Is it in musculoskeletal? I mean, where, where should we go to start obtaining some of these bigger grants and really having a major input into, into future research and publications? All right. So yeah, that's the hard one. Uh, obvious, you know, obvious answer would be diabetic foot, right? Because that affects a lot of people and that's more like a, life or death type of situation rather than you know we can't we can never get a grant for hammer toe surgery right if it's you know how straight hammer toes are those are important to us but i'm just saying you know as a profession to try to come up with some groundbreaking stuff in medicine we probably have to go to more systemic you know diseases like diabetes and uh and so what we do a lot of amputations um amputation research uh you know especially here in, you know, South Texas, uh, because of the underserved area, uh, amputation and its effect on, 
a lot of stuff, social stuff, uh, psychological stuff. Uh, that's I think that's that's something significant that we could show as a profession to get into you know medical community to have some level of ground to discuss about research. I, I like that. You know, it's in, we've talked over the years about doing some collaborative efforts among the schools and colleges of podiatric medicine. I know Rob Snyder in Miami does a lot of research. And this is more uh, clinical research, of course, with, with companies. But I think that there's a lot of brain power among the colleges. It'd be fun to get a group together and really kind of sort that out and see if we couldn't do some collective work. I think it'd be phenomenal. I have a great topic and we can talk offline about it that okay. I think would be amazing for a multi-center study just to other, look at. You know, other, you know, obviously ankle fracture is common too, and that's kind of significant too. So that's another thing. So you could do some research on, uh, ACFAS is starting the registry. Uh, yeah. so we could do something with that too, with that large number. Speak. I wanted to ask you about the registry. Yeah. That was on my, my list for you. Uh, you have listed that the um, you're part of the council of the National Registry Management for ACFAS. Can you talk about that? What what is that? So uh, the board asked me to be the chair, and uh, my answer initially was no. I don't think that's going to do well, right? Uh, but when I did research uh, on that topic, and then we have to do it. We just have to do it. There's no, you know, there's no. Uh, um, we can't avoid it. If you, if we want to sell our profession, if you want to brand our profession, we have to have si some science to back it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my initial response was, I don't think anyone's going to do it. I don't think uh, um, we could do it. We don't have manpower, or you know. But uh, and some some people some some people criticize it because uh, that's going to actually hurt us you know if the results are bad um that could hurt us um but i've done research on that too and i talked to people in the registry and then in the past there's no case that registry actually hurt the association so um that's that was assuring and uh i think uh we need to we just have no choice to to the profession to grow and just to compete with other profession does similar stuff I, so what I, does that process look like? Go ahead, Jeff. No, I, I go ahead. I like you're following on. I was going to follow on with a different question. Go ahead. So in terms of the registry, what, what exactly are we wanting to register? So uh, obviously this is from the uh, ACFAS. So front and ankle surgery is what we you know, uh, focus on. And we identify, you know, what's important to focus on first. And we come up with the questions and, you know, try to make it, uh, uh, manageable for the participants, and that's how we create it. Makes sense. I was I was going to have a side comment. I was looking at uh, the American Medical Association Facebook posts, and many times what they do is they take articles from uh, JAMA, and then they will kind of make them uh, palatable for for non scientific people, and then they they support their research through their. Um, mm -hmm. if social media. And I think when you said, how do we brand the profession? How do we promote the profession? I can't think of a better way than good, solid research. Right. Yeah. Joe, I have a question for you. Um, this weekend, speaking of ACFAS, you got an email uh, saying that we received an uh, educational research grant from ACFAS for ankle arthroscopy education. You, you want to comment on that? And I thought that was really a neat, neat opportunity for our college. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a, a quick plug, if you will. Um, one of the things here that we're wanting to look at, and um, again, we're, we'll see each other in just a couple of weeks and it'll be fun to, to talk about, but um, some of these arthroscopy simulation devices have uh, become a little bit more popular in the orthopedic world in terms of training. Um, it's part of the competency-based education for their programs. And there really isn't anything published in our literature or even, I think, programs that are making use out of them. My sound just got weird. but So um, we're going to purchase one of these devices and looking at uh, training students and completely novice users and um, kind of mirroring off some of the orthopedic studies that looked at transfer validity, content validity, and um, see if it has a place 
in our world, which I have a, a hypothesis that it does, that it's going to have a, a big impact for something that's very um, hands-on, that has a steep learning curve, but um, giving students and residents more opportunities to practice those skills outside of a real experience and seeing how that translates. So it'll be fun. It'll be neat to, to work on. And Yeah, a lot of those innovations, I think those help. And um, well, you guys are cutting edge uh, education there. <laughs> I mean, Thanks to Joe. Joe, to Joe be, wrote the research, so thank you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's fun to be at a school that that um, there's been a lot of yes. So it's like you know you dream crazy things, and um, I'm probably going to be an expensive faculty member because it's like, hey, let's do this. And Jeff's usually like, okay, that sounds great. So um, you know, figuring out how to how to make it really um, impactful for the students, but then also like, how do we translate this into to your you know to the research world, like not only is it fun and exciting, and engaging to play with this stuff, but does it work? Is it worth that? Is, is that, is there enough of a benefit? Um, and I think for a long time, a lot of the simulation stuff just hadn't caught up in terms of, it was very gamified. It was very, you had to learn the, the device, which wasn't really real world. And, you know, the technology has changed remarkably. So anyway, the, the future is really exciting. And, um, I think I think we need to get into more of uh, education research too. So yeah. I think it's a good place, you know, good funding resource, you know, for education out there too. So uh, I think that'll be interesting. Yeah, and you and I have had some again some fun chats and um, just about you know curriculum and how do we engage students, especially these you know, younger, newer generation that to, to your point, like they can find most of this information that they want to find online. They have to know what questions to ask. So how do we help support them in ways that you can't get off the internet? Right. And it's, it's, it's exciting because you almost have to flip the script. And I, and some of the, the things that we do in that faculty education program, I think has also been a really interesting um, thought process, right? Le learning more about learning and um, yeah. yeah yeah so i have a question for you too but uh i don't have to do this but so i could do it later but i have a question about how to teach calcaneo fracture we just talked about it on the ao you know <laughs> ao meeting but i just did the uh, calcaneo fracture lecture and you know, they try to understand the 3d orientation yeah. of all the fragments and stuff like that and I, I i think you had a great idea so i need I need to chat with you about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll see you in like two weeks and we can, yeah. I'll try to sneak a calcaneal sawbone into my bag on the airplane. We'll see if they think that's really weird, but <laughs> so oh, in this kind of, education geeks, yeah, yeah, right. And this is where, again, it's, it was funny. It's funny when you meet someone and you can just sit there and, and seriously have, I think we talked for like 35 minutes about, um, uh, multivariable regression models or something anyway. And after the fact, like walk back to my hotel room and be like, that was such a really fun and engaging conversation. Just, you know, just randomly yeah. weird, nerdy things. Yeah. So in this, um, you've had lots of academic appointments outside of your professorship, including being the director of continued medical education for the Texas Podiatric Medical Association, uh, the chair of the annual scientific conference for the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, and then also faculty for the AO North America. What, what drives your passion for education? Well, uh, you know, those positions really, you know, I was kind of forcing to those positions, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Voluntold. <laughs> Voluntold, but <laughs> no, I, I no teaching is you know uh, fun, right? Because you could see the result right away, and you could affect a lot of people at same, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people in this one lecture as opposed to seeing one patient at a time. So you know, the, you know, passion comes from seeing the results, I guess. Uh, yeah, residents see getting, that. You know, get, residents getting graduating and. Uh, seeing patients making money and, you know, uh, buy me dinner. And it's like, you know, like uh, exciting to see the results. Hiro, what's your vision for the research department at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley? So right now our, our school is, uh, so whole school, University of uh, Texas Rio Grande Valley is going from R2 to R1 status. So, Right now, a lot of metrics that we try to meet 
are already there. So we have to, so we, we actually really working on money, you know, uh, uh, you know, how much expenditure and things like that. So the short-term goal is to get a lot of money. <laughs> whatever, that, whatever the topic of the research is, you know, we try to get a lot of funding. Uh, so that's the short-term goal. Makes sense. I know I had a few ideas over the years where I went to the ADA and I went to the NIH and I went to the Department of Defense. And it, I, I referred to it, it's like, I don't know if you do any fishing, but it's like trolling the waters, right? Hoping something bites. And, uh, but, it, but you know what? Money makes the world go round. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the short term goal. But, you know, we, 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 you know, we are applying for, you know, a lot of grants and we, because of the location of the school, a lot of people, you know, we talked to the you know, local senators and representatives, they want to see some, some, what's going on locally, right? Why the McAllen, Texas is the fattest place in United States last couple of years. So why this is happening here? Why, how does amputation happen here more than rest of the Texas, which is more than rest of the country? So those research, uh, there are a lot of local interest. And we need to do those so that, that we could publicize our school and we get a you know, local involvement and a community involvement. And that's how new school can kind of be part of the community right away. No, I like that. I, at our school, <clears throat> we Kristen Cinema, one of the senators from Arizona, um, she has a particular interest in diabetes. And last year, we put in a, a grant to look at the highest risk patients, right? Those that have had wounds, they're healed. How do you keep them healed, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she, we didn't get the grant last year, but she told our president that it's a good chance we'll get it this year. So I think that we could take research like that and extend it beyond state borders and work together yeah. on things. I think getting getting letters and help from local it was it's, she's a uh, you know senator senator but you know local representative and those people I think helps uh, getting all the you know fun, you know funding come coming to the school. But I th the other lesson I've learned is um, when they say no once it doesn't mean no forever right you got to keep going back to the well um, and that makes a difference sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. So what are your interests right now? What are some of the things, either clinically or in research, what are the areas right now that get you really excited? Uh, we just finished analyzing uh, data on how minor amputation, I don't want to give up the answer yet, but <laughs> how minor amputation affects the, you know, major amputation and death, right? Because our thought was once you get a, you know, amputation is going to go more proximally. So, you know, do what are we supposed to do with minor amputation or yeah. go straight to the BK or whatever, right? So um, those are kind of interest for a while. Uh, like last 10 years, we've been working on it. Uh, is it really worth preserving limb sometimes? Right? Yeah. So th those are the, you know, are we wasting effort, money, or patient's quality by doing little by little as opposed to uh, go straight to BK. That's not going to be popular in our profession to say that we should just do BK, but uh, we're analyzing data right now. The answer is probably it depends <laughs> on different things. <laughs> so how, how it depends, right? So what, yeah. what factors and so that people can know which, which people can benefit from BK rather than... Um, you know, 200 graft applied to the ulcer. Exactly. I'm sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, but I, again, like th these are like the tough questions, right? But they're so valuable because when you're trying to counsel a patient about what their options are, having some meaningful data to back up the why we're giving them either two options or one option is so valuable, right? As if I'm a patient, I mean, nobody wants to lose any part of their body, right? But helping kind of put a perspective or put a framework in place to say, look, you know, we have looked at this. It's not just like, you know, I'm, I'm being cruel. We've really looked at this and we've looked at its impacts on your, you know, overall function, your life, your metabolic needs. And these are the things that we found. That is really useful as a patient in helping them make the decision that they're going to make. And it doesn't mean that everyone's going to go for whatever it is right. that you're proposing. But 
that's the, that, those are the questions we need data on, right? That's right. what we need information on. So I'm really excited to see what you, uh, what you guys come up with. If you couple that with the registry, you know, if you mm -hmm. have that procedure done by DPMs, the success rate is 40% versus, you know, well, 90% versus 40% or something we can show. Right. That that's even better. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's valuable for patients. Hero, have and, you, and, oh, oops, sorry, sorry, I was going to say, that's also what kind of helps change what we do and evolve us as a profession, right? Like, you know, learning what is a functional amputation and what is not functional. Right. And, you know, to, to your previous point, having worked in a, a different health system, um, you know, we had this little bubble <laughs> of people that we, you know, took care of. And to Dr. Schuber, Jack Schuber's point of, you know, it's almost like a minimum security prison. Like these people don't leave. So you can follow them. You, they, you know, you have more access to all of their data and then working in a completely different practice environment um, and seeing the different things that, you know, had been done on patients and these completely non-functional amputations. And then they're ending up with these recurrent ulcers and the impact that that has on their life. And again, that's not really where we're going as a profession. We're much more in line with how do we make people's lives better, right? So I, I love that. I think that's going to be really meaningful and valuable. Here, I was going to ask you if, if you've worked at all or, or if there's collaboration ever between registries, because I know Caroline Fife has the U.S. Wound Care Registry, and, you know, they, you know, they have published studies, um, you know, five, six-year longitudinal studies a lot. I, one, one stat sticks in my mind, uh, between 96 clinics in 20-some states, they saw just under a quarter million visits, right, of patients with wounds, and offloading was only documented in 4,900 of them, or 2%, you know? So, so, I mean, those kind of things, you know, tenants of wound care, vascular assessment, infection control, offloading, debridement. I mean, my question is, can registries work together at times? I, I, I think so. Um, I think something like that needs to be started by us, right? Because we know all the important, medically important factors. Um, so if, you know, say vascular surgeon started the registry and has valuable and, you know, wound, and probably we don't have enough information to do anything with that registry. So um, I think, yeah, I think that the team uh, has to have our profession, uh, someone from our profession. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of running a little bit short on time. I, I didn't want to end this interview without asking you what you do when you're not doing research and thinking about podiatric medicine. How do you recharge the battery here? Uh, I, I, I caddy for my kid, uh, my son. Uh, he, he plays golf and I caddy on the weekend, and uh, it's it's fun. It's probably the most fun thing I've done. Uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, you know, golf and uh, spare time, you know, golf and family. I've and heard I'm, you're quite the chef. Chef, yeah, I, I, I cook. Uh, you know, South Texas, you know, unless you love Mexican food every day for every single meal, there's nothing else. Nothing much else to eat, so um, I cook every meal, and um, I got used to cooking different types of meals. Now, do, do you but, live? Do you live in Harlingen or the campus for podiatrists, or do you live over in McAllen, or do you Harlingen. live somewhere else? Yeah, Harlingen. Uh, oh, Harlingen, point, right? Yeah, uh, point seven miles from the uh, school, which you know my clinic is you know same you know next building too, so everything is within. One mile. That makes it easy. More traffic. Yeah. <laughs> I have a final question for you. Yeah. So a little birdie told me that your residents from Baylor Scott White called you Captain as a nickname. Yeah. yeah. Um, Where did that well, come from? Well, I wasn't the residency program director or any, you know, I didn't have any title. So I, you know, made myself a title and you know, <laughs> called me Captain. <laughs> 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 oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. No, that, that is great. Um, how, how do you like being involved at the uh, grassroots level of starting a new school hero? What's that like for you? 
That's that's yeah, that's I mean, once in a life opportunity, I guess. You don't, you know, only happen ten times in the uh, history. <laughs> so uh I'm in the one one of them. So that's that's great. I mean, but a lot of responsibility too, right? I mean, you could um off the record, you know, uh, you don't want to screw up the students, right? <laughs> because just because they're first, they trusted us to um come to this school and you know there's a potential that we can screw up so uh, a lot of responsibility but at the same time you could you know all these years of teaching and you have your own philosophy and you get to apply those philosophy and so that's exciting at the same time well it's a good thing there's a lot of support with the council cpme and other schools coming together so i know everybody's out there rooting for University of Texas Rio Grande Valley to be really successful. Yeah, I get a lot of lot of support from the state state organization and the you know UT the state, um, you know because UT is a branch of you know U, uh, Texas government, so uh, a lot of taxpayers' money and a lot of support, especially in this area because of a uh, high rate of amputation. I know the other schools are a little bit jealous about your admission application process. It's it's fine tuned in Texas. No, I mean, I, it's, it's, yeah, but I, you know, we still, we, we still have a, you know, similar issues, right? Because uh, not many people know about it and uh, our, we have a lot of people, but same people apply for MD schools too. So one number may be inflated because, you know, they apply for other schools and the poetry school may not be the first choice for a lot of them that are applying. Which takes us full circle back to the beginning that we need a branding operation in our, in our yeah. profession and get the world knowing what podiatric medicine is all about and what podiatric physicians do. Yeah, so yeah, community outreach is a big thing. So uh, every time I, you know, we publish something or we get a grant, then we just post it and uh, you know, let the local representative and senator know about it, and they post it on there, so they know the existence of a school. And once they know, all the kids like to get involved. And, you know, uh, so well, that's, that's, doing all- that's what it takes. Um, well, here on behalf of uh, the profession, thank you for helping out with the beginning of the 11th School of Podiatric Medicine and <laughs> all you bring to the profession. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we're going to send you one of these Dean's Chat Cups because on those early morning caddy experiences, you're going to need some caffeine probably. Uh, and. Yeah, uh, okay. If anybody, for all of our listeners out there listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a five-star rating. And, of course, if you're on YouTube, uh, where everything is found, right, Hero? On YouTube. Uh, (laughs) Please do become a subscriber. So cheers, everybody. Until next week, thanks again, Hero. All right. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) 